Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in which we will discuss renal transplantation. Renal transplantation is a treatment of choice for end-stage renal disease. Let's take a case-based approach. If you were to examine a patient, comment on the features that you would expect. On inspection, the patient should appear comfortable. You would note a Rutherford Morrison scar or a hockey stick scar noted in the right or left iliac fossa. Comment on the size of the scar and whether the scar appears recent, old, or whether it appears healthy. Note any other previous scars on the abdomen from previous access sites or dialysis catheters. When you palpate, particularly over the Rutherford Morrison scar, you would note that you would feel a well-defined superficial dense mass which would measure approximately six by three centimeters with an indentation in the medial aspect. And that would represent the transplant allograft kidneys. You should aim to palpate and blot the kidneys. If the kidneys are large and blottable, this may be consistent with the etiology of polycystic kidney disease, which led to end-stage renal failure leading to the transplant. Percuss the mass and you would expect the mass to be dull. The temperature should be normal and the mass should be non-tender with no evidence of erythema and no evidence of shifting dullness. And that's because you'd expect the kidney to be functioning and the patient to be euvolemic. Auscultate and you should hear normal bowel sounds in the abdomen. Now try to discern why the patient developed renal failure, eliciting various clinical signs. Examine their conjunctiva. Look for signs of anemia. Patients with chronic renal failure have reduced EPO levels and that can result in anemia. Look for signs of gum hypertrophy. This may be as a consequence of immunosuppressant drugs such as cyclosporin. Look for signs of oral candidiasis. Again, immunosuppressants will allow opportunistic infections such as candida to colonize the patient. Look for signs of pre previous renal support. There may be an AV fistula sighted at the proximal left arm or forearm. And this would have been used as a previous site of hemodialysis. And is it functional? The, if it is, it will exhibit a flu fluid thrill and a systolic machinery murmur. And remember, this is a surgically created AV fistula and it's a connection between an artery and a vein. Usually, the radiocephalic arteriovenous fistula is between the cephalic vein and the radial artery. These can become co uh, complicated. This includes they can become stenosed, thrombosed. They can have reduced blood flow due to arteriosclerosis and particularly with advancing age. In the neck, look very carefully for a collar incision. And this may be as a consequence of tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which resulted from the previous chronic kidney disease. Remember the mechanism of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Most calcium, approximately 99%, is stored in the bones. There is a small amount of free calcium in the serum. In chronic kidney disease, there's a reduced excretion of phosphate. That excess phosphate binds to the free calcium, dropping serum calcium levels. These reduced serum calcium levels stimulate the parathyroid glands to secrete PTH. This is physiological secondary hyperparathyroidism. The excess phosphate impairs the enzyme 1-alpha hydroxylase, which is required to activate vitamin D in the kidneys. This reduced activated vitamin D reduces calcium absorption from the gut and also stimulates the parathyroid glands to secrete PTH. Again, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now, this persistent high PTH levels activate osteoclast and osteoblasts and cause renal osteodystrophy. And over time, the, hyper, the parathyroid glands will become autonomous and will secrete PTH autonomously. And this is known as tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Renal osteodystrophy, the activation of osteoblast and osteoclasts, leads to mineral bone disease. And radiologically, you'll see subperiosteal uh, resorption, looser zones or pseudofractures, osteosclerosis, particularly in the spine, you can see what is known as a, a rugged jersey spine, that sclerosis of the vertebral body end plates, fractures, osteopenia, 
and soft tissue calcification. So it's important that these patients are managed early on by aiming to control the PTH levels via phosphate control. Patients are advised to reduce their dietary phosphate. Patients can be given phosphate binders such as Cevelamer, calcitriol or activated vitamin D, and calcium emetics such as Sinicalcet. On all of these, try to increase the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptors to decrease PTH levels. But it's important to avoid oversuppression of PTH because adequate levels of parathyroid hormone are needed for normal bone remodeling. Otherwise, you'd have accelerated renal osteodystrophy. The other thing to determine in a patient with a renal transplant is to ensure they're euvolemic. So you should auscultate the lungs and the legs to make sure there's no signs of pulmonary or peripheral edema. And if the patient is euvolemic with no edema, that suggests that the transplant kidney is functioning well. The other key thing to look for in renal transplant patients is whether or not they have any signs from immunosuppression. If they're on steroids uh, chronically, they would develop iatrogenic Cushing's. They would have symptoms of weight gain, they may have striae as, as demonstrated here, and they may have multi-system effects including thin skin, fragile skin, acne. From a psychological point of view, they may have anxiety or depression or altered emotional control. Vascular complications include hypertension, bone complications include increased risk of fractures, and in males, and uh, in males, they may have erectile dysfunction and in females, absent or irregular menstrual cycles. Now, how do we assess patient's transplant function? If the transplant is successful, then that suggests that there's no fluid overload. The JVP will be normal, there's no peripheral or pulmonary edema, and there's no ascites. If the transplant has failed or is failing, then you would expect a reduction in urine output a consequence increase in uh, fluid, so they may have peripheral or pulmonary edema or ascites, and the JVP may be elevated. Moreover, some waste products may accumulate. Uremia would result in the patient uh, feeling uh, itchy, they would have pruritus or excoriation marks, and they may even become encephalopathic. The kidney itself would be tender, there may be erythema and signs of infection and abdominal pain around the site. So what causes end-stage renal failure and clinically how can we pick up signs that would indicate the original etiology? Diabetes, hypertension are common causes of end-stage renal failure. The glomerulonephritides, polycystic kidney disease are other important causes of end-stage renal failure. And then chronic pyelonephritis um, or benign prostatic hypertrophy leading to chronic bladder outflow obstruction and myeloma are other causes of renal failure. Clinically, you can determine whether the patient has diabetes by examining the tips of their fingers, looking for finger prick marks, or whether, or you can offer to perform ophthalmoscopy, looking for signs of diabetic retinopathy. Hypertensive uh, renal disease can be determined by examining the patient's vital signs, or performing ophthalmoscopy, looking for changes such as silver wiring and AV nipping in the retina. Glomerulonephritis may manifest with changes in the urine and polycystic kidney disease clinically, the patient would have large bilateral blottable uh, cystic mass in the abdomen. Pyelonephritis again can be picked up with the urine dip, the loin pain and the patient history and BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy would be picked up with bladder outflow symptoms in a history and myeloma you'd expect positive Bench Jones proteins and bony pain. So putting all of this together, not only uh, not only are you picking up the Rutherford Morrison scar and the mass underneath, but you're examining for the etiology of the end stage renal failure and presenting that to the examiner. And you're also looking for complications of immunosuppression. You then offer your differentials. You'd expect that this patient has a renal transplant and you'd comment that the etiology may be diabetic, hypertensive uh, nephropathy, or as a result of PKD or glomerulonephritis. So putting this together, Mr. Smith is a Caucasian man presenting with shortness of breath. The patient was comfortable at rest and I believe that the gentleman has signs consistent with a renal transplant. On examination, the patient appears comfortable at rest with generalized bruising, cachexia and pallor with signs of previous excoriation. There's a Rutherford Morrison scar in the shape of a hockey stick present in the right iliac fossa, which is 12 centimeters long. The scar looks healthy and is recent and well healed 
mild peri wound breezing at the lateral aspect of the wound, and there are also some previous well heel scarred on the abdomen from access sites of all dialysis catheters. Deep to the scar on palpation, there's a well-defined superficial smooth dense mass measuring 6 cm by 3 cm with an indentation in the medial aspect representing an allograft kidney. Percussion over the region is dull, the temperature is normal and the mass is non-tender with no evidence of erythema. There was no evidence of shifting dullness and on auscultation, normal bowel sounds were present. The patient had pale palmar creases as well as conjunctival pallor, suggestive of anemia due to redu reduced EPO deficiency. Also of note, there was an AV fistula at the proximal left forearm exhibiting a fluid thrill and a systolic machinery murmur. I noted a subtle 3 cm collar incision likely from a parathyroidectomy and the patient may have developed tertiary hyperparathyroidism as a result of previous chronic kidney disease. I also noted side effects from immunosuppression, including steroid therapy, striae thin skin bruising purpura, effects from cyclosporin, the patient was deemed to be hypertensive, hirsute and some evidence of gum hypertrophy, but I noted that there was no evidence of peripheral edema or pulmonary edema, indicating that the patient is euvolemic and the transplant is functioning. You may be asked about the stages of chronic kidney disease. There are five key stages, stage one to five. Stage one is where the GFR or the Gamelia filtration rate, the estimated GFR, is more than 90 mils per minute. Gradually in stage two, the GFR drops to between 60 and 90. In stage three, 30 to 60. Four, the GFR drops to 30 and 15. And five, which is end stage renal failure, is where the GFR is less than 15 mils per minute. And at this point, the patient should be considered for dialysis as well as transplantation. You may be asked about what symptoms patients will experience as they develop uh, advanced kidney disease. The symptoms would include fatigue, weakness, anorexia, vomiting and metallic taste from the uh, waste products being built up, pruritus as a result of the urea, they may develop bone pain and restless legs. The signs as a consequent of renal disease will include uh, pallor due to the anemia, a yellow discoloration of the skin, brown nails, purpura and bruising, excoriation, the patient would develop hypertension and potentially cardiomegaly and a pericardial rub. There are a number of other complications of chronic kidney disease, hypertension due to the activation of the renin angiotestin aldosterone system, uremia and azotemia results in lethargy and pericarditis and encephalopathy, Uremic frost is where you can see the sweat that evaporates, crystallizes due to the presence of urea crystals. The patient may develop electrolyte abnormalities and the one to be aware of is hyperkalemia. And that's because the distal tubules are unable to regulate potassium and that can lead to serious arrhythmias. Uh, the patient may develop hyperphosphatemia and that would accelerate hyperparathyroidism and they also may develop advanced atherosclerosis and dyslipidemia. Thrombocytopenia is also common after renal transplantation and needs to be monitored and post-transplant post uh, patients need to be monitored for malignancy due to the drugs that they are on. Hyperuricemia and gout are other key features that need to be monitored because the calcium urine inhibitors such as, such as cyclosporin reduce uric acid secretion. So in summary, we've talked about the case of renal transplantation, how to present the complications, chronic kidney disease, its manifestations. Thank you very much for attending this Medicine Masterclass.